You know, sometimes the readings match up very well with kind of what's going on in the world and current events and, and so, so on and so forth. And sometimes they don't. And this is one of those times when they don't. Oh, I could probably talk about all kinds of dermatological uh, infirmities as the uh, readings do. But uh, in society, even in the church today, believe it or not, is Valentine's Day. And it's actually the culmination of Celebrate Marriage Week. And so it's important we celebrate marriage, the union of body and soul between one man and one woman, especially Christian marriage. That's what I'm going to concentrate on today. I'll say a quick comment about the gospel, though, because there is one thing that needs to be kind of noted here. And you notice when Jesus and the leper approaches Jesus, of course, he's violating the law of Moses in doing so. And as he always does, Jesus enters into the reality of the person who is in front of him, the one who he encounters. And in this case, it's real significant to note that Jesus reaches out and touches the leper. Now that is so unreal, so significant, because in doing so, you, weren't, you couldn't do this. It was not allowed. And in doing so, he renders himself unclean. We have a problem with our cord here. Thank you. And uh, so he renders himself, enters into the reality of his uncleanliness, and then transforms it, and the man is made clean. Now, the irony now is that Jesus can't move about freely. And he has to stay outside the town, and he can't come in, so the tables are turned. And uh, so he enters into that reality and changes it. And uh, it's important, because this is what Jesus does all the time. Jesus enters into our reality and transforms it. So it was for the leper, so it was also when he went to the wedding of his friends in Cana. And so today he transformed that you know, very uh, normal institution into what we call the sacrament of marriage today. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk about basically the essential properties and fruits of marriage just so we have the common vocabulary. I'm going to talk about the five stages of marriage that were shared with me by a wise person once. And a little bit about this, the reality of separation, divorce, and then kind of bring it all back, uh, back into, uh, into the realm of hope. Um, so there was, you know, it was a, a, there was a parish not unlike this one, and they were doing a Celebrate Marriage Sunday, and it was kind of cool. And, uh, oh, I forgot, I'm going to bless all the married couples at the end of the homily, too, so get ready for that. Um, and they were at, you know, and so... Mr. Sabatini was there, and the pastor said, Mr. Sabatini, you and your wife have been married for over 50, for 50 years. He says, to what do you attribute, you know, the, the, the faithfulness of your marriage? He's, and Mr. Sabatini says, you know, back when, at our 25th anniversary, I took her to the old country. And the pastor said, well, that's wonderful. What are you going to do for your 50th? You know, I think I'll go back and get her. <laughs> So, now, married love is different than other kinds of love, isn't it? You know, I've got six sisters. I love them all. I'm not going to marry one of them. I have a brother. Love him like a brother. And I love my mom, and I'm going to marry her. Um, now, married love is unique, and the sacrament of marriage is something very special. And as understood by the church, marriage has these two essential properties, and what we call three characteristics or fruits. The essential properties are unity and indissolubility. And we talk a little bit, and we mean about marriage, we talk about unity, it is the total gift of self, body and soul, to one spouse. All that I am, I give to you without reservation, without condition. And to do so, you have to know yourself inside out and backwards, because you can't give away what you don't have. And you need to know the one you're giving yourself to, inside out and backwards, because you should never give yourself away without great deliberation. And you need to know the context and the nature of the relationship in which you're giving yourself. So because marriage is not something that is done on a whim. So this idea of unity, body and soul, join person, you know, it's a covenant and covenants joins persons and the human person is body and soul. So that idea of unity. And second, the essential property is indissolubility. A valid marriage is permanent and lasting until death. 
And Jesus said, what God has joined, let no one divide. You can find that in Mark 10, verse 9. It's important to keep this in mind while preparing for marriage. Uh, marriage is not something, as I said, you do on a whim. But if a couple is well prepared, then the characteristics of marriage come very much to the fore. And we talk about these characteristics of marriage, these fruits of marriage, as St. Augustine called them, this idea of permanence, fidelity, and fecundity being life-giving. And each one of these, you know, is kind of sometimes seen as a burden by modern society, but they're actually a very wonderful gift to the couple, aren't they? We talk about permanence. What does permanence give you as a married couple? Well, permanence allows you, believe it or not, to love imperfectly. And you're going to do this. You're going to make mistakes. And, and those of you who have been married for a while, you know what I'm talking about. But what permanence, a gift of permanence gives you is the knowing, gives you stability of knowing that relationship will not end just because one or the other makes some mistake or sins against the marriage in some way. And, it, and in so doing, what it allows you to do, it allows you to love completely, without condition, without reservation. It's amazing. That's what permanence allows us to love, to go, as the poker players say, to go all in. Let's talk about fidelity. Fidelity is when I take you to the exclusion of everyone else. I take you. I take you. And in that mutual self-giving and self-reception, you understand that there's nothing that you can do to earn the affection or the love of your spouse. It's a gift. And so it gives you the gift of gratitude. Also the gift of reverence. And as every server will tell you, what is reverence? To reverence is to be prayerfully attentive to the needs of the other. And you know this. Love intends the good of the other. That's all good. Your good old Thomas Aquinas will tell you that. Love intends what's good for the other, the best good for the other. And so I'm attentive to what your needs are and, and anticipating those needs. And couples get very good at this over time. In fact, they get so tuned into one another, eventually they start finishing each other's sentences. Have you ever noticed this? And when you get to that stage, yes, and those of you who are early on, you are doomed to become your parents in this regard. There's nothing you can do. And that's all right, because it's a good thing. And let's talk about now, so you've got permanence fidelity, and let's talk about fecundity, to be life-giving. To be life-giving. Love by its very nature creates. It gives life. And in the church, of course, as I said, this is body and soul. And in a good marriage, those aspects are certainly a, a wonderful, a wonderful possibility. And to be open to that possibility, to be able to co-create with God. And in the physical sense, we're talking a love that is so intense in its expression that nine months later, you may have to give it a name. It takes on a life of its own. Love, by its very nature, is life-giving. But there's also, but that's only one part of marriage, because, you know, the, uh, your kids are always your kids, of course, but that's, it's not just all about that. Now, there are married couples that are incredibly life-giving. I know who, for whatever reason, were never able to have kids. And, but it's, it's amazing. I have a, there's a friends of mine that were, uh, and, you know, they've been married for 30, 40 something years. And, um, and it's amazing, and, and they've uh, been involved in the RCIA, and they've got what they call their spirit kids. They probably brought 30 to 50 people into the church at various times, invited them in, and so they'd be baptized, and, and it's amazing to be that kind of life-giving. And there's all, they're the kind of people, too, that there's always sort of, they're enlivened. You get around them, you're just better for having been around them. They're just life-giving. They invite you into their relationship. And you are enlivened because of it. That's the affective is, is important as well. And it's a good, it's a good, it's a good benchmark too in marriage. And you're making it, and this is this is the Brodies. I borrowed it from them off a of married off an engaged encounter. Um, any decision you make within the marriage, whether it's to buy the snow machine or the washer and dryer or whatnot, I don't you know, whatever decision you're making, they say, you know, they, they said, you know, ask yourself, is this use this criteria? Does it give life? Does it take life away? Does it make life possible? Does it diminish life? Is it a life-giving decision? On, and if it is, um, then, then, then that will help guide your decision, whether it's emotionally, physically, or spiritually. So, but because it's, it's not easy, of course. When we see, but when we see 
the married couple. I mean, I'm amazed. I'm like the, you know, we priests, we're like the, the offensive coordinator. We're up in the booth here, looking down on the field, can see the patterns and whatnot, have a different perspective. And I'm amazed at the great sacrifices and the great uh, love that, that uh, people make. And, and you get to see where love is present, sacrifice does become easy. And when we see how you love each other in good times and bad, in sickness and health, all the days of your life, we get just a glimpse, just a teeny tiny glimpse of what it means for God to love us. And the faithfulness of God. And, you know, um, that one of the best times I ever saw this was with uh, Jerry and, oh, what was his wife's name? Smith. Jerry Smith and his wife, um, wasn't Geraldine, but it was one of those wonderful names. You remember old Colonel Smith and his wife had the great shock of hair? They were the quintessential Alaska couple. And, you know, they were, and they're, you know, kind of, both kind of round, and they had those cable knit sweaters with the huskies on the back, and he always had this big uh, pipe hanging out of his mouth, and this big shock of white hair. And uh, one day, she had, uh, Ge Genevieve was her name. And one day, um, and she had had a, as long as I had known them, they had had a, you know, she had had a stroke about 15 years earlier. And she could only say two words or, or two phrases. She said, that's nice and thank you. It was amazing. If those are the only two words you can say, not bad, not bad. And one day, it was over in the old church here, he was getting her ready for mass. And he was just combing her hair. And she was letting him. And just the way that they were doing it, he was doing this, um, you could tell. And it just spoke volumes. And I, told, I spoke to him one day. I said, you know, Jerry, it's really good the way you take care of Genevieve. He said, ah, oh, Father, this is nothing. He said, she followed me all over the world with my military career. He says, this is nothing. And then off he went. If you can preach the gospel by combing your wife's hair, you've achieved something. You really have. It's not easy, though. It is not easy. And that's why uh, I'll talk about the five stages of marriage to sort of help. The five stages of marriage. Um, the first, marital bliss. If you're lucky, this lasts for hours. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then there's what we call disillusionment, which is, and kind of in the technical term, though, the stripping away of illusions, where... Um, just the nature of married relationship, there can be no illusions if it's going to be real. And a lot of times that can be rather humorous. Honey, what's this for? You don't want to know, dear. Oh, I guess I didn't. Um, or it might be um, something that's rather sobering. When you realize that all of your own shortcomings and character flaws and those of your spouse don't go away simply because you got married. And that there's things you need to work on that relationships take work. But remember, the truth is never a bad thing. It can be a very sobering thing sometimes, but it's never a bad thing. And then there's this idea, that third stage called kenosis, or this emptying of the self, typified by sheer exhaustion. And it's when one or both parties are physically, emotionally, or spiritually exhausted. And it doesn't have to be anybody's fault. It could be um, an illness, it could be a financial crisis, a natural disaster, or something. Sometimes it is somebody's fault, but oftentimes it is not. And the relationship is sort of in crisis, because it's characterized by a lack of feeling. And this is where a lot of people, especially in the secular world, will panic, because they don't understand that love is not a feeling. It comes with every feeling, doesn't it? It comes with great joy, with great sorrow, with great triumph, great tragedy. It's every feeling. And you learn that love is not, especially married love, is not a feeling. It's a decision. It's a choice. And the living out of that choice and that vocation um, is, is what, it, a lot of it is what's where the rubber hits the road. And so a lot of people will sometimes get scared, like, I don't feel like I love you. Well, no kidding, you can't feel anything. You're exhausted, let alone affection for your spouse. And when we are completely emptied, that's when the grace of the sacrament really kicks in. And God, who, who can do amazing things, can fill us then. And that's where we get to this point we call reconciliation, which is the rebuilding of the relationship in a way you cannot imagine before. 
It's a, and leading to that fifth stage, deeper covenantal love. And it's, uh, in a way, we can see how a good marriage, if we understand the five stages of marriage, in a way, we can see how a good marriage truly is a reflection of the Paschal mystery. We talk about humanity that was in a state of, we actually call it original bliss. That lasted right up until the second chapter of Genesis. Third chapter, excuse me. And then the illusions were stripped away. And then the relationship with God and humanity was in crisis, but in the fullness of time. When things had run their course, in comes Christ, comes and all creation is reconciled to the Father. And the result is a deeper relationship with God than could ever have been imagined. Incidentally, this is where the Moonies go wrong in their theology. They want to return to the Garden of Eden. And a lot of times couples will come to me and say, oh, we just wish we could go back to the way it was at the beginning. And I'm like, why? That was unsustainable. That was then. This is now. God has something much deeper and much more profound in store for you. In my experience, I think about every relationship especially married relationship, defines itself, redefines itself about every seven years. There's a, there's a psychology paper waiting to be written on this somewhere. Healthy relationships go through this same process and get deeper and more intimate as a result. Unhealthy relationships will either go into suspended animation for another seven years or will fail at that point. That's why I think you see a lot of divorces and separations at 7, 14, 21, 20, 35 years even. Which would bring me to this point about, this, uh, about separation, divorce, declaration of no lease, sometimes commonly called an annulment. Um, the sad reality is that often through no fault of their own, a person or persons will find themselves separated or divorced. And there's a number of reasons for this that we won't go into the day. I will say in my experience that I have seen there are no good divorces. There are necessary divorces, but no good divorces. And I've mentioned before, in a good marriage, here is somebody who knows all of your vulnerabilities and honors them. And too often, in a divorce or separated setting, we see that here is somebody who knows all of your vulnerabilities and is willing to exploit them. There are no good divorces. There are necessary but no good ones. And when this happens in our midst as a Christian community, we need to recognize the pain and the suffering that comes with such a state of affairs. And we as Christians are called to accompany those who suffer such pain. Because it is at this time that they and their children especially need the church more than ever. Now, I don't often get to preach against heresy, but I get to do so today, and I love it. There is a heresy out there. I'm not sure how it got started, probably in Hollywood or by people that don't understand the church, but whatever the thing is, there is some heresy out there that if someone is simply separated or divorced, that they are uh, excommunicated, that they cannot come to communion. That is patently false. I studied canon law for three years in Rome, and, I, and that is still the case. That has never been the case in the church. That's, as I said, when you need your church more than ever. So don't believe this heresy. And if you know anybody that feels that way, let them know. Send them to me or whatever. Talk to them. Say, no, it's not right. This only, the, the only time this becomes an issue is if somebody, like anyone, would, I mean, this isn't just for separate divorced people. This is anyone, is living with someone with whom they're not married or has gotten married outside the church. That's when it becomes a problem. And if a divorced person, you know, does find somebody special with whom they wish to get married, you know, we're going to investigate that previous marriage based on the idea of unity and, and to make sure. And uh, in order to make sure they're free to do so, they can petition the archbishop, the tribunal, for a declaration of nullity. And we'll investigate the previous attempted marriage to see if it was valid. People ask, what do you mean valid, Father? Well, very quickly. Imagine you're making a, a batch of chocolate cheese. You know, marriage has certain elements that need to be present. And I mentioned them early on here. If any one of those is impinged in a significant way, then the marriage is probably not valid. So think like you're making a batch of chocolate chip cookies and either intentionally or unintentionally you leave out the one ingredient that by definition makes it a chocolate chip cookie. What do you got? Well, it's kind of brown, it's tasty, but ain't got no chocolate chips. It's not a valid chocolate chip cookie. 
That's kind of what we're talking about. Or sometimes you ever substitute salt for sugar in a recipe? So it all looks really good on the surface there. You have, yeah, I just, I just saw an eye roll, you know? And it looks great on the surface, you know? Yeah, we had the priest, we had the church, we had all this, you know? But underneath there was something that was, was there that shouldn't have been there. And you don't know until you investigate, bite into it, and you find, ooh, not a valid chocolate chip cookie. Set that one off to the side. That's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about validity. So, so don't be afraid to ask for that as well. If that's a, or if you know somebody that's in that situation. Um, because it is, it is very cathartic. It's a very cathartic process. We need to have that healing. Because, you know, it's not easy, this marriage thing, but it is so important. It is so important that we strive, that we try, that we enter into this. Because we know, as good married couples show us, that it is so wonderfully possible. And what a good marriage does, the Irish have this wonderful expression, being a great and noble race of people. That's my gene pool, okay. <laughs> and they say, and there's this Irish saying, may the love of God warm your heart like a great fire, so that a friend may come and warm himself there. And a good marriage is like that. It's life-giving well beyond the relationship of the couple and their family. It enlivens the neighborhood, the community, the whole society. It's like a great fire that warms everyone there. It's not easy. But it is so worth it, even to try. Society needs good marriages. The church needs good marriages. And as such, the church will always defend, preserve, and celebrate marriage any way we can. And so for those of you who are married or have been married, thank you. Thank you. May your witness to God's love inspire us all to strive for such a self-sacrifice, for such a Christ-like witness. And so, I've gone on long enough, and I would simply ask uh, the married couples in our midst. Um, I know sometimes folks, you know, there's a lot of people traveling, but for those that are in our midst anyway, and those of you who might be at home, uh, go ahead and I'm going to trek over here to get the book uh, to the chair to get the book of blessings. Why don't you stand in the meantime? Just just the married couples. Bow your heads for the blessing. Lord God and Creator, we bless and praise your name. In the beginning you made man and woman so that they might enter a communion of life and love. You likewise blessed the union of those among us so that they might reflect the union of Christ with his church. Look with kindness on them today. Amid the joys and struggles of their life, you have preserved the union between them. Renew their marriage covenant, increase your love in them, and strengthen their bond of peace so that they may always rejoice in the gift of your blessing. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you may kiss the bride. Amen. <laughs>